Now, this morning, I want to look at the cross from a little different perspective. Maybe a perspective that you haven't considered. I think that many times we consider what the Lord has done, including his work on the cross. And many times we consider it only from the benefits that it brings to us, which I think is very self-oriented. What I want to do is I want to look at what the cross reveals about the Lord, about what he has done, who he is, Because I think that that is a more important way to remember him than even what he has done, how he has made us the beneficiaries of his work on the cross. I believe there's a very real difference between the two issues. I believe that there is a greater message here than only what he has done that benefits us. So read with me here, beginning in verse 36. Matthew 26, 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter, the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther, and he fell on his face, and he prayed, saying, O my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, this is a passage of Scripture, specifically verse 39, and this request of Christ that people ask me about all the time. And I believe that this is such a key issue in reference to why we celebrate communion, what the cross of Christ means, and the ultimate purpose of God. And so I want to focus this morning your attention upon this particular verse. What does Jesus mean when he says, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me? I believe that this is really what the cross reveals. It is the greater message of the cross. Not more than what benefits it brings to me. It's what God was doing. You see, the cross reveals here the willingness of Jesus to drink the cup, the cup of God's wrath, his judgment against sin, against your sin, against my sin. You see, he was willing to drink the cup of God's fury so that you would not have to. Now, how do I know that this particular passage refers to the cup of God's judgment? Let me read to you a couple of passages from the Old and New Testament. First, Psalm 75, verses 7 and 8. There David says, God is the judge. He put down one, he exalts another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. And the wine is red, it is fully mixed. He pours it out, surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. Notice in this text, he is referring to God as a judge. And then he refers to this cup using this metaphor of a cup of wine. And then he says, the wicked of the earth will drain and drink it down. Very clear. Jeremiah twenty-five fifteen. For thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, Take this wine cup of fury from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. Again, a clear indication that the cup is a cup of fury, a cup of judgment. And then last in Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11, 
This is during the tribulation period when the Apostle John sees and hears the angel declare a very solemn message. It says, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself also will he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. And so here John sees and hears a very solemn message. He hears the message that if anyone worships the beast who is the Antichrist to come, the coming world ruler, and takes the image, takes the mark of his name, which is a number, if they do this, they will drink of the cup of his indignation. Now this is very clear here. In all of these passages, you see this, this metaphor of a cup that is to be drunk by individuals, which is his judgment. Now, the Father is a just and a holy God, and he must punish sin. He is a holy God. And we forget this many times. And yet this is declared every day and every night in the presence of God. His holiness. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. This is what the angels proclaim day and night. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And so His holiness is is at stake. His holiness is the issue. And so, because he is holy, he must punish sin. It says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. That's why Jesus died. He took the wages of your sin, my sin, upon himself. He took the punishment. He drank the cup of of God's indignation so that you would not have to experience His indignation. That's, that's the revelation of the cross. And we forget this part of the cross. We usually look at it only from the benefits that we receive. But the revelation of the cross is a revelation that Jesus was willing to take that cup and to drink it full strength for you. This is the meaning of the cup. This is why what he knew was coming. This is why he prays, Father, if, it, if there's any other way, if there's any other way for men to be saved without me drinking this cup, then so be it. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So he drank the cup which means there is no other way for men to be saved. God answers the prayer by allowing His Son to drink the cup. And He did that to reveal who He is in all its glory. There is no other way for mankind to be saved. Jesus is the only way. That's not what I say. That's what he says. I don't have any problem with that issue because it is clear from his actions here. There is no other way. Now the second thing that the cross reveals is the glory of his grace and the riches of his grace which he purposes in himself. Read with me Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. There Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that he should be, or we should be, holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. And how did he do that? Why did he do that? Notice, according to, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to, notice, His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself. Now, God is a holy God that must punish sin. And recognizing that fact, that Jesus drank the cup of God's indignation, recognizing that only magnifies the riches of the glory of His grace all the more. But you cannot truly recognize His grace until you recognize His holiness. You see, His holiness is what demands justice for sin. And that justice was death. And Jesus was willing to take the cup and drink it full strength for you and me so that we don't have to drink that cup ever again. We don't have to even worry about that. So God is not only a God of righteousness and holiness, but he is also called in Scripture the God of all grace. So the God of all grace, the God of all mercy, is also the holy God who requires justice for sin. That holy God revealed himself to you and me. And he revealed himself to you and to me so that we would see the riches of His grace. Truly, this morning, I want you to focus on His grace, on the riches of His grace, the riches of His mercy that has been bestowed upon you. Set your mind on who He is, His righteousness, His love, His grace. Yes, we are the beneficiaries of that grace, and of that mercy. But it's because of who He is that we have become the beneficiaries. We have experienced the fruit of who He is, what He has done. And that is where our attention needs to be. You see, truly to remember Him. Communion is not to remember the benefits to me. Communion is to remember him. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And so our focus needs to be upon him, not upon us. Yes, we are the beneficiaries. I don't want to shortchange that. But it is only because of who he is and what he has done. So are we exalting him or are we exalting ourselves? You see, communion means we are to exalt Him. In Psalm 34, 3, David says there, O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt whose name? His name together. Let us exalt His name together. Psalm 95, 99, 5. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at His footstool. He is holy. He is the holy God who has demonstrated His goodness, His righteousness, His mercy, His grace. 
This is the message that we need to remember. Now, thirdly, the cross reveals more than just how much God loves you. Isn't that what we usually consider at communion? How much God loves me. But the cross is to reveal so much more than just how much God loves me. It's to reveal that God is love. You see, there is the focus. How about that passage of Scripture that we all quote so often? What's the point of and the focus of John 3.16? It's, for God so loved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. You see, that's the point. It's God who so loved. This is a choice of love that is beyond my comprehension. Why do I say that? Well, I have put myself into those shoes of the Father, and I can't imagine giving my own son, for you that are parents, think about it, put yourself in his shoes. Would you give your child for someone who could care less? I don't think so. I don't think I can do that. That only shows me how little I really understand of how God so loved. I understand just a fraction of what that means. And yet that is what we need to focus our attention on here this morning. Put your attention upon what He has done not what you have received. Much of the time, I think we just focus on the benefits of the cross and how they relate to us. But note how the apostles, their focus was so different than our focus. Let me read to you two passages. 1 John 4.10 Notice John says here, For in this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So John here is saying, you know what, don't get focused on anything that you do or you receive. Put your focus on him. It is his love. Notice, his great love. He loved us. He loved, not I love. In Ephesians 2.4, there Paul said, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. It's God. It's his great love. He loved us. That's the point. That's where my focus should be. Now this is not just a play on words. This is a real issue. As I've said before, our focus so often is what I get. That's so self-oriented. And that is many times our problems as, as a Christian. That's our problem as a church. We are self focused and we turn everything around benefits us. And that that's backwards. We are of who the Lord is. That's why we are benefited. Because of who He is. That's the point. And so, this morning, I want you to focus on that fact. Because it's what He has done for us. Not what God has. It's what He has done, not what He has done for us. I think much of the time we only consider what the Lord can do for us today. Much of our prayer life is focused on what He can do for me right now. And yet the model prayer that we see in the Scripture that Jesus gave is very different. What does He teach us to do when we pray? He says, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name, you see. 
Your kingdom come. Your will be done. You see, it's all about getting your eyes off yourself and getting your eyes on your heavenly Father who loves you, who is gracious and merciful towards you, and He has revealed that by what He has done at the cross. It reveals that He is love. He is gracious. But He is holy. You see, this third issue of love, I think, is the perfect balance. You see, God is love. That's what the Scripture says. But that love is revealed in perfect justice and mercy. You have to put those two things together, justice and mercy. When you put those two together, you have the correct definition of what real love is. You cannot love without justice. You cannot love without mercy. Those two must go together. And so here we see that brought together. Much of the time we only consider what God can do for us instead of, Lord, what do you want me to do for you? It's interesting that when Paul the Apostle was confronted by the Lord on the road to Damascus, that's the first thing he asked the Lord. He said, Lord, what would you have me to do? See, when you recognize him, that's what you naturally want to do. Lord, what, what can I do to serve you? How can I serve others? You know, much of church activity is even all self-oriented, self-focused. So much of what we do is for our own benefit alone. Instead of denying ourselves, which is the point of the gospel. If you want to follow me, Jesus said, it's deny yourself. Not cater to yourself. Abandon yourself. Turn away from self. And look for some way that you can serve me or you can serve others. So when the church gets focused only on itself and benefit to itself, and what can this church do for me? Well, I'm telling you, there's, that's a prescription for trouble. What can I give to this church? What can I give to these believers? How can I serve others? You see, that's a totally different focus and causes tremendous change to take place. But it always means death to self. In Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It, it, is, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, notice how Paul connects these issues of Christ giving himself together with what he knew he needed to do for the one who loved him and gave himself for him. He said, I've got to be crucified with Christ. There it is. That's death to self. Putting my life, the I, to death. That's why he says here, nevertheless, not I, but Christ lives in me. So where is your focus? Are you focused on what he can do for you? What he has done for you? Or what you need to do to serve him and to serve others? Now how can you take some application away from this study this morning? What would this revelation and what should it do? Well, it should bring you to a place of exalting him. And so as you partake in communion this morning, will you privately acknowledge him, exalt him, bow to him, acknowledge what he has done because he is holy, he is gracious, he is loving. There isn't any reason for him to do that in me. It's not because I'm such a great catch. 
I'm, you know, oh, he just knew what I could do for him. No, it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with who he is. Secondly, I would ask you to, to ask the Lord to show you where you can serve him. Who you can serve. How you can be a servant to someone. That is what he wants. You see, Jesus said, this is the example I leave with you. I have done these things to you as he washed their feet so that you would go and do them as well. That was his point. Third, I would encourage you to share the message of what God has done with someone this week. Again, so often we, you know, we want everyone to come to us instead of us do what Jesus said, and that is go to them. You see, again, it's turned around. It's backwards. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So I need to share my faith with someone. I cannot be a secret disciple. If I don't want to suffer for the gospel's sake, that's why I don't share. I don't want anybody making fun of me. I don't want anybody putting me down. I don't want any hassle. And so that's why we are silent. We need to speak up. This world is dying. It is dying. And you have the message of eternal life. Share it with someone this week. And fourth, I want you to remember this morning that there is not only a cup of judgment, but there is also a cup of salvation. So read this passage with me from a different perspective, understanding what the cup means. In Luke 22, verse 19 and 20, there Jesus said he took the bread and he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup, interesting, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. It's interesting here that Jesus uses the same image of a cup. You see, this particular statement is made and he is acknowledging here clearly that the only way that there can be a new covenant is in his blood, which means that he has to drink the cup of God's fury, of God's indignation. He must drink the cup of judgment if we are to ever drink the cup of salvation you see, that is used throughout the scripture as well. In Psalm 116, verse 13, there David said, I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. So there is a cup of indignation. And he drank that cup so that you could drink and take up the cup of of salvation. So when you take the broken bread and the cup in your hand this morning, take it with a different perspective. Remember Him. Remember His holiness, His graciousness, the riches of His grace, and His love. Let's go to Him in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning that, Lord, you have demonstrated who you are, your great purpose, your plan. Lord, that you would reveal yourself to us. Lord, that reveals who you are, a God who cares, a God who wants to bestow grace and mercy, but a God who has suffered the judgment of your holiness. You've taken that upon yourself. Lord, what a revelation of who you are.
May our eyes be fixed afresh this morning upon that incredible blessing of who you are, what you've done. We give you praise this morning. And Lord, I pray that our knees would be bowed to you afresh and anew. Lord, as we acknowledge your righteousness, your holiness, your right over us, that your will must be done, your kingdom must, be, must come. Lord, we want to fix our attention there. Lord, help us to be a part of bringing that kingdom to other people's lives, sharing the kingdom with others. Lord, help us not to be silent. Lord, anything in us that is resisting you, resisting our knees being fully bowed to you, Lord, reveal that this morning, whatever it is. Lord, we want to come to that place of full and complete surrender, denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following you. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, you're not a Christian, or you're not sure if you're a Christian or not, I want to give you the opportunity right where you sit this morning to make that decision. I don't want you to leave here without at least an opportunity to respond to Him, to receive Him. He loves you, but He will not force His way into your life. You have to make a decision, a choice, to bow your knee to Him, to acknowledge your sin, to turn from your sin and your sinful lifestyle. In fact, if you don't want to turn from your sinful lifestyle, then praying this prayer with me right now is going to do no good. You need to make a decision to turn. That's repentance. Reversing directions. Are you willing to reverse directions and repent of your sin and follow Him? If you are, then I want you to pray with me right now. Just... Acknowledge your sin to Him. Say, Lord, forgive me. Say those words, Lord, forgive me. I have broken your law. I have disobeyed you. I have lived independent from you. I surrender my heart to you now. Jesus, come in, take over my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. Help me to follow you. Are you praying that prayer? If you just prayed with me just now, I want you to acknowledge that you prayed with me, that you committed your life to Christ. Raise your hand, please. If you prayed with me just now, acknowledge that, that you did. Just raise it up. I'd like to see it. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. God bless. Anyone else? Lord, we pray that you would touch these lives this morning. Lord, bring the power of your Spirit into each heart. Bring that reversing of direction, Lord, the power to reverse direction. Only you can do that, Lord. Enable these hearts, these lives to do that this morning. We believe you to do it, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.